Race bikes are incredibly complicated bits of kit, and they're very sophisticated. And here's a sophisticated guy with me. This is Matthew Carter of PI. They look after all the data logging on the bikes. Matthew, what have we actually got here? Right, this is um, Pi System 1 data logging for motorbikes. Uh, we have a, a data logger emitted on the front here, which has various sensors over the bike, which it collects, and then you download at the end of the lap. So to log data, it's got sensors all over the bike. What actually is this one got? That's correct. It has a front wheel speed sensor to get to know that the bike's moving. We have an RPM signal from the ignition. Um, we have a beacon for the uh, lap time. And we have a gyro for map making. When you say a beacon, this isn't a flashing light, is it? No, no, that's right. Um, we have a beacon transmitter on the pit wall, which inf um, has an infrared light. And then you have a receiver on the bike. As it goes through the light, it stops the time that you've got on that lap and starts the next one. And looking at the display there, the rider can actually monitor his lap speed as well. That's right. Here on the left hand side of the screen, he can display anything that he chooses that's logging. On the right hand side, it flips up his time every lap. And, and this gyro, it's in a very sensitive part there at the front of the seat. It, it, it monitor private parts. Yeah, sensitive sensor in a sensitive place. Um, we cleared it with John earlier. Um, yeah, it's mounted there in the middle of the bike, so you get a good reading. It gives you a map of the circuit, so when you look at the data in the evening, John can see where he's taken his lines, etc., and what revs and gears he was in. This map of the circuit, this isn't pre-programmed, it's actually reading lean angles and g-forces, is it? That's right. You can have different maps for different situations, um, a wet map, a dry map, etc. And also, John may take a slightly different line to Ian or something. And you can just, it gets, gives you the rider's exact line rather than the concrete on the track. Well, Matthew, I've got the black box in my hand. Very lightweight, it feels as well. Yes. So what happens now? Right, what we do now is we come in after the session. We then plug in the computer into the logger, uh -huh. like so. The information is downloaded within two seconds. And I see you've got it on the toolbox. Is there any, <laughs> any reason? That's right. Well, the team used, used the data logging in the computer as just as another tool. Um, enabling them to gather information about the bike and make decisions to change. So it's in its rightful place. OK, exactly. far away then. So we have here have a, the gyro-generated map, so you have the position on the track, etc. We've got the, the arrow there is where the beacon is on the pit wall, so they know where they're getting their lap times from. So this is one John Reynolds did earlier, This is one he did this morning, yeah. Yeah, OK. You've then got the, the outline of the track, which is the actual line that he's taken. And you can then add on the split times, which is giving you the times between all of those points. So he can reference those with each individual lap to see where he's gained and lost time. It's a brilliant piece of kit. And are there sort of other pages behind it? I mean, you can manipulate the data, no yes, doubt. Yes, you can. You can graph um, any of the traces, like revs. All oh, right, yeah. You've then got an outlap there with the revs trace. And you can see on the PC the, the cursor moves on the... Oh, yeah. On the map. So Just like they do on the, on the telly when they're in the position exactly, of cars yeah. then. Yeah. Exactly, so yeah. It's, uh, and again, all this is your own kit. You've designed all this. Yes, yeah. we've developed all of the hardware ourselves. We design all the boards, the black boxes, yeah. and we, we write all the software ourselves as well. And I think this uh, little slogan here catches it all, doesn't it? It's not big, but it is clever. Exactly. Exactly what the system is. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Matthew. Thank you. Well, no matter what you do to your bike, if you set the engine up and all the rest of it, you're not going to go anywhere if, unless you've got the suspension straight. I've got with me Wayne Lamb of Proflex. They've developed special shock absorbers, and Reve Racing are running with one. Wayne, tell us about this special shock that you've got on here. Yeah, the shock absorber works uh, different to a conventional unit. By just on the damping side, instead of having just shims and a piston, we also have a needle down the centre of the body, which can be made to various tapers, so that the damping can be made to the rider's requirements, like soft, slow, and then soft again, which so is basically like a carburetor. But also the other thing that this shock incorporates is a heat-sensitive damping control. So as all conventional shocks, as the shock starts to work and the oil gets warm, it gets thinner, which often causes shock fade. But in this, the, the thermostat works from 0 degrees to 130 degrees. So whatever you set the damping at, it stays constant. Well, is that an electrical thermostat or, or what? No, it's a, a paint design. It's, it's a bit like a fluid in a thermostat in a car. Yeah, or yeah. on a, a radiator control on your domestic radiator. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's adjustability, really, that yours yeah, has got to Yeah, it's, it's more fine-tuning. Yeah. Um, you can really fine-tune it to, rise, to the rider's requirements. 
Okay, now you do road shops as well, do you, if, if the road rider wants one? Yes, we do, yeah. yeah. And what about, have you got any hints and tips for us for setting up suspensions? A lot of mystique to it. I mean, can you give us some tips on our bikes we've got outside? Yeah, we can give you some quick tips to give the riders some idea. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Okay, Wayne, here's my bike. What's some sort of simple tips from ground up, as it were? Right, the first thing we need to do is uh, see what sort of travel you're getting on the rear shock and on the front forks. Um, and by doing that, we just use an electrical tie wrap uh, round the forks at the top and also at the top on the rear shock, uh, which then slides down to show you how much travel you're getting. Yeah, so as the suspensions come up, it'll move that and leave That's it there right. on the stand. And then you, you can see then if it's going through the bump stop or only halfway, so then you can know if your spring rate is soft or too hard. Yeah, so you can really see what effect you've had on altering it then. That's right, and yeah. then as you change the damping yourself, you can see then how much or how little that the uh, tie wrap works after that. I saw you with some of the other guys, you were actually pressing the bike in the middle on the tank. What was the idea of that? Um, yes, to try and get the bike to match, the, both the rear and the front should both match. And to do this, you find the middle of the bike. Um, we can get it up. Don't drop it. <laughs> and uh, you press with both hands, and the back and the front should go down together. But on this one, they don't, because the, the forks are harder than what the rear is. Right. It, but is that something that you can find to a rider's preference? I've actually found that the front forks are OK. It's the back that I've found too That's hard. That's right. So then you suit which way it is. So then you have to alter the back yeah. to come down the same as the front. Now, on the Ducati, these really are multi-adjustable on these Olands, aren't they? You can actually do rebound, preload, the whole caboodle. That's right, yeah, which basically you need. Yeah. If you buy uh, Japanese stock stuff, they've only got a few adjustments. They're easier for the guys to use, but... There's not a lot of adjustments on them. OK, well, if we go to the Honda CBR behind, which happens to be Mr Paul Johnson's. Right, so, so what can we do with Paul? Uh, we do the same thing again. We, we try the, uh, the tie wrap on the front forks and on the rear shock. Um, press the bike in the middle to see if the, su the suspension matches. Um, which on this one, it's a little bit better because we've had a play with it this morning, but we're fully on the adjustments now. Right. We've got no adjustments left, which means if the rider can't get what he wants, then the shock has to come off and be re-shimmed to his requirements. And what sort of adjustment can you get? I mean, this is typical of many sports bikes, so what's the sort of range that you can get? The range is, well, for the road, it's adequate. But if you were to start racing, then you need to go up on the damping. Right, so on the front forks here, we can do the preload on the springs, can't we? Yeah, if you were to race this, you would go up on the oil weight um, and just harden the damping up right through and, and adjustments for the rear shock that was down here on the swinging arm yeah the trouble is with this with this model here it only has adjustments for the rebound and obviously you can adjust the spring but to fine tune it you really need compression damping okay and we can just see the two adjusters if you could just point those out to us Ed. yeah the two adjusters if you a little hole through there to put your screwdriver in and that alters the rebound to fast or slow whichever way you want to do it yeah. Now, is it something that the ordinary guy watching this should do, or, or what? Are there any warnings on this? Um, not really, because basically the bike is just a, a mass-produced bike, so it's just set up for, you know, for anybody. And the suspension's there for them to play with. And so, I mean, what I'd always do, if you're going to move it on the clicks, is sort of take a note of where you're starting, at least, so you can put it all back if you do make a mess of it. That's right, but when you find most of the bikes when they come out, like the Yamaha we did this morning, well, if you like, we'll just have a look at that one. The rebound was coming far too quick, um, which really is, is more dangerous than not. As the shock started to get even hotter, it started to fade, and uh, as he said, it was throwing him about a bit. And, and you quite quickly evaluated that just by bouncing on the back. Could you give us a demonstration of that, Wayne? Will do. Now, you've had a play with this one now, haven't you? That's right, yeah. Before, when we pressed it down, it was returning too quick. Yeah. It was like nearly picking the back wheel off the ground. It was topping out. You also, when you set your bike up, you must also make sure that when you uh, alter the preload on the spring, that you always have a touch of sag, which means you can pick a free weight up, probably three or four mil. Yeah, so that, that means the sag means the spring is already partially compressed. Yeah, that's right. So when on the return damping, it's not topping out, it's not kicking the back wheel up. Yeah. 
And are you are always available for um, advice, or is there a charge for that, Wayne? No, the advice is all free. Okay. <laughs> well, thanks very much for Wayne uh, from Proflex. Thank you.